Hey, we're going to go in a lot of places in the Bible this morning, but you can go ahead over to Acts 24 to start. You know, when I was a new Christian, I really um, had a battle that if I hadn't won it, really would have crippled my usefulness for the Lord and my confidence in trusting the Lord to serve Him. And what it was, when I would sin, as I was taught, I would confess my sin. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, He's faithful, He's just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I would claim that verse, I would go to it, but I just seemed to never have a clear conscience about it. And I just would seem to, to live with the guilt and thoughts of inadequacy and, and really struggled with that feeling of guilt not going away. And they would linger and I would feel like I was failing God. And it wasn't a sense or a matter of me feeling like I was losing my salvation. That to me was, was settled it was more a matter of me feeling like I was losing my, my usefulness for the Lord. That I wasn't pleasing the Lord. That I couldn't call upon Him with confidence because it just appeared to me and felt like my, my sin wasn't going away. It was just staying there. And it really was a battle for my conscience. And, and really, the battle for a clear conscience is a very, very important part of spiritual warfare. I think in most books or things I've read or listened to about spiritual warfare, I, I think it's a part that doesn't really get attached in the realm of warfare when it's dealt with. But I'll tell you what, it's a real battleground. Because if, if you don't have that clear conscience, which gives you confidence toward God... And gives you credibility toward others. Man, it's going to paralyze you. It's going to hold you back. It is going to cripple you in your usefulness for God. You know, Paul sized up, really, the importance of a clear conscience for us very clearly in Acts 24, 16. He said this, herein I do exercise myself. Here it is. To have always a conscience that is void of offense toward God and toward others. Paul's basically saying to us, this is a foundational truth that was critical to his life as an apostle. And he said, here's where I exercise myself. The word exercise means to apply himself, to put effort, to put energy into it. It's like kind of that person who gets up, you know, with the sun and goes to the gym every morning is the first person there when the door is unlocked. Man, they're committed. They are exercising themselves toward that goal. Paul said a clear conscience was so important to him, having a clear conscience towards God, which allowed him to have greater confidence, a clear conscience toward others, which gave him credibility, he said was such an important thing. Our conscience is the place of confidence with God. 1 John 3.21 says, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, then we have confidence toward God. So what's the flip? If our heart does condemn us, we're living with a condemned conscience, then what? We don't have confidence for, toward God. And that's a problem. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God, right? And if my faith is ailing and my confidence is lacking, then I have a hard time really being used by the Lord. You see, without a clear conscience, there is no confidence. And our faith struggles and we become crippled in our spiritual effectiveness. That's what I experienced very early on in my Christian life when I really didn't have the knowledge and the understanding of dealing with. Because at that time, what, what I had, and we'll get to later, is I had a, a weak conscience or a weakened conscience. So this morning, I want you to gain a clear understanding and a strategy to win the battle for a clear conscience in your life. The first thing I want you to notice is God's design for the conscience. So basically what we're answering here is why is the conscience such a big deal? Really, we think about it, we talk about it, but what actually is it? What does the Bible say about it? Well, Romans 2.15 gives us a great understanding of the conscience. It says, it's talking about the Gentiles that were not with the law of God. It says, they show the work of the law written in their hearts. And notice this, their conscience did what? It's bearing witness. 
And how was it doing? By their thoughts that were what? Either accusing or excusing them. What does the conscience do? The conscience is a referee that is bearing witness to the decisions, the action we're taking. And it's calling balls and strikes in our life. It's either accusing or excusing those decisions that we are going to make. Think of the conscience like a home alarm system, right? So the intruder comes in the house, right? And it's detected by the sensors and the sensors make the alarm go off. And what does it do? It calls the owner to action, right? With your weapon of choice, maybe it's a baseball bat, maybe it's a gun loaded on your nightstand, maybe it's a golf club, I don't know. But there's this call to action, and because that intruder, you're alerted to it, you do something about it. Now, I want to say right here, if you have Cheryl Grover living in your house, you do not need an alarm system. She's over there, I was looking for her. The other night, I think it was Friday night, we're, we're in bed sleeping, right? Right? And all of a sudden, I wake up, and Cheryl's getting out of bed, and she's going out of the room, and she's turning lights on. I'm like, what is she doing? Is she checking to see if Anna Beth came? It's 3 in the morning. You know, I'm like, Anna Beth came home along. What is she doing? And so I get up myself, and I go to the bedroom door, and I open it. And she said, get that frog and throw it out of the house. <laughs> Who hears a frog from a sound sleep plopping on the floor in another room? She says, I thought something was leaking. I heard plop. Plop was a little tree frog. Fortunately, he cooperated with me, and I was able to grab him right away, Ben, and I didn't have to call any help, and I was able to throw him out of the house. So if Cheryl Grover is sleeping in the bed next to you, you do not need an alarm system. Her ears are crazy good ears. But that's what an alarm system does, and a conscience does that for us. It's like an alarm system for the soul. We're faced with a moral issue. The consequences are detected by the conscience, which discerns whether it is a threat. And if it is, it triggers an accusation in us. Maybe it's guilt. Maybe it's a sense of shame. Maybe it's physical pain. You see, a defiled conscience can start messing with your stomach, your headaches, everything else. Maybe it's just a sorrow. A sorrow that can overwhelm you. And there's biblical examples of each of those. See, so that it's detected, it warns us in our soul, and then it gives us an opportunity to do what? To spring into action and to deal with it. What should that lead us if we're violating our conscience and something that's wrong behavior? It should lead us to repentance and reconciliation, which will lead us to peace, the peace of God and living as God desires for us in his will. You see, the conscience was intended by God when he created it to be a judge of our actions. As we read in Romans 2.15, it, it bears witness. Psalm 51.3, it alerts us. David said, my sin is ever before me. His conscience wouldn't let him ignore it. It alerts us. It it testifies to our sincerity. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 1.12, he talked about the sincerity of his conscience. And so the conscience is a very valuable thing that God has placed within us for our good. This built-in system that that keeps us safe. And that's an awesome thing. We ought to view the conscience as a great thing, a good thing. It doesn't always feel good. Sometimes it's poking us when we need to be poked, right? But it's a good thing. It's something God created and designed to keep us out of trouble and out of misery. Now, the conscience is not foolproof because it can be conditioned by our repeated choices to do the wrong thing. Um, An unbeliever is said to have a defiled conscience. In one place, it talks about an evil conscience. Titus 1.15 says, to the pure, all things are pure. That's a pure conscience. You can enjoy life. Your conscience isn't ringing bells in your ear. To the pure, all things are pure. But to them that are defiled and unbelieving, he says, nothing is pure. But even their mind and their conscience is what? It's defiled. It's not working the way that God intended for it 
to work. Now, even a Christian, a believer, can corrupt his conscience through repeated sinning. Repeated acts of ignoring that built-in alarm system. That's why we have to rely upon the Holy Spirit as He works in concert with our conscience to sanctify and to cleanse our conscience. You see, so it's part of the sanctification of our conscience. It's that work of the Holy Spirit within our soul. And that's why so many times when you read about the conscience, you read about the Holy Spirit. It's almost a synonymous thing. When you read about the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, there's almost a synonymous thing. Why is that? Because the Lord is working in concert through what He's created in us to be able to affect us and help us to live in the peace He desires for us. You see, to live with a defiled conscience is to live a life of doubt, doubt towards God's acceptance, an inability to approach him in times of need with true hope that he's going to actually help. You know, it says in Hebrews 4, it says that we can come confidently through the throne of grace, that we can obtain mercy and we can find grace to help us in our time of need. So the truth is, we can come confidently to God's throne as a believer anytime, not because of what we did, but because of what Christ did. But when our conscience is defiled, when our conscience is speaking the wrong thing, when the the battle is going on, man, it can, at best, we go to his throne with a total lack of confidence. At worst, we just don't even try to go to his throne at all. And Satan wins the day. So we see that the purpose and what God intended in our conscience, the second thing I want you to know this this morning, um is Satan's attack on the conscience. You see, the importance of the conscience makes it a strategic target for the devil. You know, we're not ignorant of his strategies. We're not ignorant of his mechanism that he puts into work against it. And a very usual and typical tactic of Satan in many realms of the spiritual life and war is to take something that God intended for good and God gave us for good, and he wants to take that thing and he, he wants to corrupt it for his purposes. He wants to take what this conscience, this lovely thing that God gave us to be a, a warning to our soul, to keep us safe, to keep us from evil and danger. And even when we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, we don't have to fear any evil because, man, we have a conscience that's clear with the good shepherd. But man, Satan wants us to live in fear, in dread, in doubt, and in misery. And a great way he can do that and thereby paralyze our usefulness to the Lord and thereby deprive God of the glory he's due is to attack us in our conscience. You see, Satan's desire to attack and defile our conscience by any means he can so that we might give up Hope, hope in pleasing God, hope in living a life that would honor him. You see, he wants us to give up on that. And think about this. The heart of Satan's strategy is to cause us to believe that God has given up on us so that we'll give up on him. You see, let that sink in. See, he wants you to believe that God has given up on on you. Why? So that you'll give up on him. See, he's the accuser of the brethren. He's a liar, right? We have many examples of this in action. Job chapter 1 and 2, Zechariah chapter 3, were actually narratives of of Satan in the presence of God using accusation and, and resistance to fight against what God desires to accomplish in his believers. You see, Satan's attack on our conscience, it's really a two-prong or a two-fold attack. One is a corrupt conscience. He wants us to have a corrupt conscience that approves things that are actually wrong. So he wants us first to have a conscience that says yes when God is saying no. See, he wants your conscience to be broken in two different directions, whichever works best for you. 
in the one direction. He wants you to have a corrupt conscience. And that corrupt conscience is going to be telling you, yes, yes, there's no problem, there's no problem. God's screaming no and your conscience is saying okay. That's a problem. That's a corrupt conscience. The second part of his attack is he wants us to have a weakened conscience. And a weakened conscience is when we think God is saying no when something is actually a yes. You see, the weak conscience disapproves things that are actually right. The corrupt conscience approves things that are actually wrong. So Satan can get that so twisted up in us that, man, we're just kind of paralyzed and maybe even indifferent to what God wants for us. See, the first of those, and I want to kind of break them down. The first one is this. Our, our conscience is corrupted through repeated sinning. You see, we get in the habit of something. We just keep doing. And, and here Satan uses the greatest battle we face. We talked about last week what's the greatest battle we face. We said it's our own sin, right? Right? We said Satan never, um, Satan's never the reason anyone is in hell. Our sin is, right? So our greatest battle is really our personal sin. And our own sin and, and through repeated temptations, he leads us astray to where our conscience becomes more and more hardened. Starts out, I remember I was a, a youth pastor years ago, years ago. Wow, 30 years ago, I think. Long time ago, way back in another dispensation, back when no one had any fun. Long time ago. <laughs> but I had this kid. He really wasn't in my youth group. He was dating a girl that was in the youth ministry there. I remember it was a Saturday morning. I was by the church. I probably told you this story at some point over the years. And he came to me just, just weeping, just broken up. And I was like, man, what is wrong? I thought, what happened? Did a family member die? What happened? And he was just so broken up. I said, man, what's wrong? He said, I was out with some friends last night, and I can't believe I did it. I can't believe I did it. I'm thinking, he's created, committed some crime. He's going to jail. They killed someone. He was with him. He says, I can't believe it. I said, what did you do? He said, I took a sip of beer. Uh, wow. Okay, I wish I had felt that bad the first time I took a sip of beer. Um, I didn't. I had that evil, corrupt, not working conscience, right? Um, he said, I took a sip of beer. And we talked, and I reassured him of God's love for him and, and, you know, and his standing in Christ. But here's the sad part. I walked away from there feeling, wow, that's pretty cool that something insignificant bothers him that bad. I thought, that's good. That's good. He's got a tender heart, tender conscience. But you know what? Years later, same guy as an adult, horrible, horrible alcoholic. Man, terrible family situation, just kind of broken relationship, just went through it backwards. Just a struggle. You see, at some point, that conscience that was so tender through repeated action and activity and extending that action and extending that activity in a deeper and deeper kind of imbibing in that activity led him to a place where he became okay with it. You see, and what Satan wants to do, he wants us to get us down a path where he corrupts our conscience. Can even go so far, the Bible speaks of a seared conscience, 1 Timothy 4, 2, a cauterized conscience, where you, you cauterize something and there's no nerve endings anymore, they're dead. A seared conscience. It talks about in Ephesians 4.19 about being past feeling, past feeling, a cauterized conscience, corruption to the point where there's just nothing there. Paul speaks of conscious being attacked. Uh, at, oh, Paul speaks of our conscience being attached to a shipwrecked life. 1 Timothy 1.19 says this, holding faith and a good conscience which some, having put away concerning faith, have made what? Shipwrecked. So here he attaches a good conscience to good faith and this swerving away from faith, and he's got conscience mingled in there. And what does it lead to? A faith that has become shipwrecked. So Satan's desire is to destroy our conscience. 
He wants to have a corrupted conscience where God's saying no and we just hear yes or nothing at all. Second thing is he wants to attack is to weaken our conscience. And our conscience is weakened when it's not grounded in Scripture. When our conscience, you maybe are a believer, but you haven't applied yourself to, to the Word of God. You haven't applied yourself to learning and growing and understanding the Word of God. Maybe even come to church all the time. Maybe you come on Sunday, you get a shot in the arm, kind of go out the door feeling better about things for a week or so, come back for more. But maybe you've not really grounded and rooted yourself in the Word of God. You see, those, those roots that go deeper than practicality really are what hold us to the ground, man, when the horrible winds of life are blowing all around us. See, our conscience is weakened when it's not grounded in Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul is talking uh, about a situation in Corinth on whether they should eat meat that had been offered to idols. It was kind of an argument in the church, and here's what he said about some of them. He was talking about how the idol really isn't anything. It's fake, and God is the Lord of all. But he said this, there is not in every man that knowledge. For some, here it is, with conscience of the idol to this hour, they eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. So what created the weak conscience? He says they, were, they didn't have the knowledge, the correct knowledge. He said, so you're doing some things that are perfectly fine to do. There's nothing wrong with it. But understand how it's affecting a weaker brother or sister. They don't have the knowledge you have. They're not grounded like you are. You probably need to sit down and do some Bible study with them before you go getting that discounted meat uh, that was offered to idols the night before, you know, and serve it at the table because you got this good deal on meat and there's nothing wrong with the meat and you're cooking it up on the grill and your friend who's a weak Christian comes over and he's eating it and the whole time he's thinking, I thought this guy was a good Christian and here he is worshiping idols through what he's eating. Why? Because he lacked the knowledge, the reality that this was not a sin at all. You see, so a weakened conscience is due to not being grounded in Scripture. You see, with a weak conscience, you may have done nothing wrong. Nothing at all. But because of faulty teaching that you've heard and learned, a lot of that goes around, or maybe past experiences and things you battle and you struggle with, um, your conscience produces guilt in you that maybe shouldn't be there in the first place. See, it's a lack of knowledge. That was really my problem as a young believer, right? I didn't understand about spiritual warfare. All I know is that verse said do this, and I did that, and it didn't work. <laughs> so I was either doing something wrong or that verse wasn't working. <laughs> And I just really struggled with that. And I was kind of too uh, ashamed to really ask anyone about it. Because the culture that I came to Christ in was, was a very, you know, uh, tough culture. Very legalistic culture. And I mean, there's some things you just ought to get right and you ought to get them right away. You know what? You got saved on Friday and you came to church without a suit on Sunday. What is wrong with you? You're, you, don't, you don't take your faith in Jesus Christ very seriously, do you? Man, if there's hair on your ears, there's sin in your heart. Mm. 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 Nothing more defiled than a woman's bare knee. Mm. Just telling you where I was. I was just struggling with this. It was hurting my walk with the Lord. So Satan is going to capitalize on our weakness and he's going to use it to put a wedge between us and our confidence with God. So maybe you're a believer, but you're not very grounded in the word. You haven't really applied yourself to really learning the word. Maybe you feel like this a lot, that your Christian life just isn't settled. It's not working well for you. Well, that could be the result of a weak conscience. You see, Satan's goal is this. He wants, to, you to, he wants to cause you to believe that God is acting out of alignment with his word. 
So I read this verse and it said if we confess our sin, he's faithful, he's just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I confessed, I admitted, I owned it, but I still had guilt. The attack Satan is bringing there is he wants me to believe that God is acting out of alignment with his word. He wanted me to believe that guilt was coming from God. You see, he's a master deceiver. He wanted me to feel like God was speaking to me rather than he was speaking to me. You see, Satan is harsh, right? We learned that last week. He's unforgiving. Um, uh, you know, he wants us to believe that God cannot be pleased and that just everything is wrong. Everything is wrong. Think of 10 things you can do in life when you leave here today and nine of them are wrong. Nine of them are. Everything is. He just wants us to believe that way. That's why I believe a child who is um, brought up in a very legalistic home has a tendency when they get a chance and they get out the door to run as far away as they can from God. Or they just or with it become mean as the devil himself. Why? Because they've never experienced the true grace of God working in their heart and soul. They've never had that opportunity to fail and fall into the arms of Jesus rather than to fall under the guillotine for failing. You see, that's, that's the spirit of it all. See, here's how you discern this. True conviction from God for sin will always be attached to a reason. See, if God, if, if what's happening in my soul is really wrong, then there's a reason attached to it. There's a scriptural reason for it. And God's desire in convicting me is to restore me and renew me and to bring me on. But when I have guilt and it's not attached to truth and it's just kind of this gray, kind of fuzzy area of just, man, that's a spiritual attack from Satan. It's not attached to truth. It's attached to emotion. It's attached to feeling. Because God's desire in convicting us for sin is to restore and renew us. Satan's desire in really making us feel guilt over something that's not a sin is to lead us to condemnation. And here's the difference. When God's convicting you of sin, he always is leading you somewhere else. There's something ahead. There's something to do. There's a next step attached to it. When Satan's condemning you, there's nowhere to go. You're just sorry, you're done, you're evil. It's a dead end. It's not a right or a left turn. It's a dead end. You see, because he wants to destroy our usefulness for to the Lord. You see, we're not grounded in Scripture. And the strange thing about conscience is that whatever feels best may not be best. It's got to be attached to truth. The, the conscience has to be sanctified through the Holy Spirit and his indwelling and his filling in our life. You see, truth is always the guide of a clear conscience. And it comes through repeated exposure to God's word to where it becomes second nature for us to discern right from wrong. It becomes part of our maturity. Look at Hebrews chapter 5, verse 13 and 14. Great verses. Everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he's a babe, but strong meat belongs to them who are mature, even those, now look at this, who by reason of use, reason of use of what? The word, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Where does that proper discerning come? It's part of the mature Christian life as God equips us through his word. It's constant exposure to God's word through the spirit sanctifies our conscience and it restores it to usefulness and how God wants it to work in us. So here's what Satan does. In, in a nutshell, before you sin, he convinces you that you'll get away with it. After you sin, he convinces you you'll never get away with it. <laughs> So you haven't done it yet. It's not a big deal. Do it. No one cares. You'll get away with it. You're like, I'm going in. And then you do it. He says, mm, you're never going to get away with this. He's just a liar. 
He is a liar. By the way, anything Satan tells you about God is always a lie, but he does tell God truthful things about you. (laughs) See what they did? See what they did? But not with good intention or good reasons. Remember last week we learned that he's a malicious and vigilant foe. So how do we win the battle for a clear conscience? We've seen the importance of the conscience. We see Satan's attack on our conscience. And why? How do we actually win the battle? Well, there's two foundational foundational truths in the battle for conscience. God, number one, desires that we do not sin. And by not sinning, we do not corrupt our conscience. And when we sin, God desires to forgive and restore us, thereby restoring us to usefulness. God doesn't want us to sin. He said in 1 John 2, my little children, I write things to you that you sin not. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So don't sin. But if you do sin, God's not leaving you out there alone. Now, there may be consequences of that sin that linger, that cannot be undone. That could be physical consequences. That could be consequences in your emotions. That could just be, you know, just beating yourself up. you got to work through those things. But that's kind of the foundational truth. you gotta, you got to have conviction about two things as a believer. God does not want me to sin. And when I sin, God wants to forgive and restore me. But he doesn't want me to sin. And because he'll forgive and restore me is not an excuse for me living in repeated and unrepentant sin. Okay, it's not kind of, you know, just kind of some light thing. So always consider the attack that comes to your conscience in light of God's word. What I am feeling, what does God's word say about it? Whether it's an accusation for the weak conscience person or it's a temptation for the corrupt conscience person. Whether Satan is attacking you through accusation or through temptation, consider your response in light of God's word. Therefore, you have to be grounded in the word. You have to give yourself, be committed to the word. If it's legitimate, bring it under the blood. Confess it. Repentance, 1 John 1, 9. Bring it under the blood. He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. Bring it under the blood. Jesus died on the cross. He gave his blood, his, gave his life as a sacrifice for our sin. And it's through his blood that we have been bought back. Our sin has been the consequence of our sin. Our debt has been paid for. He made that substitutionary atonement for me. He took my place on the cross. He became my substitute when I didn't deserve it. Man, take that sin and put it under the blood. You've sinned, man. Bring it to God. Bring it in a recognition of what Jesus did for you. By the way, the more you sin, the more you ought to appreciate Jesus dying on the cross for you. Because you keep going back to the cross, you keep going back to the cross, you keep not to get saved all over again. That only happens one time, but just to go back and recognize the sacrifice that was made on your behalf. So if it's legitimate, bring it under the blood through confession, repentance. If it's deception, you know what? I dealt with that thing. I shouldn't have to keep, I shouldn't keep dealing with the thing I've dealt with a hundred times. It's under the blood. So if it's a deception, you submit it to God and reject it as an attack from Satan. And once again, it's through the word and through the blood. Revelation 12, 11, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. That's how we overcome. Now, you may need some spiritual counsel in this. You may need someone who knows the Bible better than you know the Bible to sit down with them. Here, just one website I'm going to tell you don't go to for this. Watchtower.org, okay? Don't go there. (laughs) Gotquestions.com, excellent site, man. Your one-stop shop for good, sound Bible advice. Okay, Gotquestions. Dot com or dot org, you kind of go there, it'll get you both. And you just type in your question and it'll probably give you five versions of it with some really good solid answers. 
You see, but you got to get the truth into the situation. You got to submit it to God, the deception. You got to reject it as an attack of the enemy. You got to be in the word and, and recognize the blood of what Jesus Christ has done for us. You see, when you think about everything I've said, I want you to put that diagram up and I want you to think of it like this. Winning the battle for the conscience, right there in the middle of the vector going in two directions, you got, you got this clear conscience. That's where we want to be, where the X is. How do we maintain that? We abide in Christ through the Spirit and His Word. By the way, that is in John chapter number 15. And if you want to dig into that, go back to our sermon archive. Go back to April 3rd of this year. I was preaching a series called Forgotten God on the Holy Spirit. And in that one, I talked about the Spirit's working and role in us abiding in Jesus Christ. Just go to our website, go to Archive Sermons, go down to April 3rd, and you'll see that. We abide in Christ through the Spirit and His Word. But what about if we have a corrupted conscience, which comes from the outward rejection of God's truth? What do we do about that? We deal with that by seeking biblical accountability. We repent of our sins and we put them under the blood of Jesus Christ. And then what do we do? We abide in Christ through the Spirit and His Word. Now what about you're in a weakened conscience? That's inward doubt. It's not outward rejection of God's truth. It's inward doubt of God's truth. What do you do with that? You deal with that by seeking biblical guidance and commit to a growing understanding of God's Word. And then you do what? You go right back to abiding in Christ through the Spirit and His Word. This is kind of, in a nutshell, a battle plan of dealing with Satan's attack within the conscience. Are you on this side of the equation? Are you on that side of the equation? And by the way, they both involve the Word. They both involve Christ. And they both involve, man, community. Biblical community. Maybe it's guidance to a better understanding of the word or someone discipling you through a growing understanding of the word. Maybe it's just accountability. Maybe your problem is not you don't know the word. Maybe the problem is you just don't know how to say no and you just need some help in that. You see, that's how we process it. We repent. He that covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. Strong meat belongs to those who by reason, who are mature, who by reason of use have exercised themselves to discern good and evil. You got to use the word. You got to exercise yourself to have a growing discernment in your conscience of right and wrong. So there's growth. There's repentance. By the way, you can grow out of immaturity, but you can't grow out of rebellion. You have to repent out of rebellion and grow out of immaturity. Two different things. I don't grow out of disobedience. I repent out of disobedience. I grow out of immaturity. You see, there's two different things there and two different paths that we're looking at here. So basically, here's what we got. We got two defenses in the battle for our conscience. You can defeat it at the headwaters of temptation before it ever drags your conscience down. The temptation is coming. You address the temptation. Man, you, you deal with the temptation in your life. And you just defeat the battle at the headwaters before it ever gets downstream to your heart and life. That's one way we deal with it. Or we deal with it the second way. By a growing understanding of God's word. So remember, the, the most important principle... In the whole battle of spiritual warfare we learned last week is this. We fight from victory, not to get victory. So why don't you go ahead and bow your heads with me this morning. I love what Robert Murray McShane said. He said, for every time you look at yourself in self-judgment, look at Jesus six times. And remember what he has done for you. And the battle for the conscience, it's such an important aspect of, of spiritual warfare. But the victory is there. Maybe you've been living beat down by your conscience. Maybe you've just been living in a way where you don't feel like you can do anything right at all. Condemned. Maybe even feeling forsaken by God. 
and you just don't understand it because everything in you wants to do the right thing. My experience is the more I want to do the right thing, the more Satan wants to keep me from doing the right thing. Hey, you have a weak conscience today. You say, Pastor, I just don't know the verse to go to. I don't really. You know what you need? You need some spiritual guidance in your life. Man, you need to come and, and you know what? You need to let someone start meeting with you and taking the word of God. You probably need to jump into our Growth Path Essentials class that starts up through the year cyclically. Get in there and, and let, let Bo and, and let um, his wife and let them help you and, and guide you and, you know, help you to kind of get your feet better on the ground. Getting into God's word. Probably you need to get into a life group where you discuss the word of God each week. You take this sermon and you kind of talk about it and discuss it and grow and learn more. But you know, you need some help. You need some help. Maybe you've been overcome by your repeated sinning so much that you just never feel guilty about it anymore. That's a bad place to be, to be past feeling. That's a really bad place to be. You know what? You just simply, you need to repent. That begins by confessing your sin. That means agreeing with God about it, admitting your failure. Maybe there's some restitution that needs to be made, but you know what? Taking it, bringing it under the blood. You need some spiritual accountability in your life if you're serious about overcoming it then be serious about getting help with it and there's loving people that will hold your hand spiritually and guide you through it to a place of victory but you know for the conscience to work properly in the first place it has to be brought under the rule of Christ in salvation if you're here this morning you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord. You do not know him as your Savior. Man, we want to help you with that. We do not want you to leave here without dealing with that. Right now, my two prayer partners are coming forward, and they're going to be up here. Even after we dismiss, they're going to stay here, and they want to help you, and they want to talk to you, and they understand how to answer these kind of questions with the Word of God. They want to be a blessing to you. You just come and they can take you aside and take time with you. You can take that card that's right there on the back of your seat, that communication card, just write your name and contact information on it. You can drop it in one of the black communication boxes on your way out. You can just bring it to me or to the next steps counter. And man, we'll be, we'll be on that and we'll get to you and we'll help you with it. We certainly don't want you to have to walk away today in the bondage of that defiled conscience and really just not knowing which way to turn. Satan's a deceiver. Satan is a liar. Satan is a destroyer. And church, he just wants us to live in that total, constant defeat. Would you just bow your heads with me right now?